Hi, this is Shanda Rubin, and you're listening to Brothers on Tennis. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? This is your boy, Isaac. And this is your boy, Bryce. And we are Brothers on Tennis. And guess what, folks? We are taking you back. We're taking you back. We've got a couple folks that we feel deserve some shine. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll we'll, you learn a little bit. I know that we learned a little bit as well. Uh, We are actually talking about Malave Washington and Miss Lori McNeil. Bryce, how about those two? What about it, man? What's your thoughts? I'm excited to talk about them. Uh, You know, I think one of the aspects of our show is that we try to provide uh, some shine, if you will, to players that don't always get the attention in some of your mainstream uh, markets and mainstream channels. And these are two players that, although they weren't the type of players that you will see their name engraved on a bunch of Grand Slam trophies, but they both had very successful careers. And, you know, during this period that we're in right now, I think people are really starting to understand that um, the the plight of the African-American in almost anything that we've done is we've had to do it better, we've had to do it faster, we've had to do it uh, in, a, in a different manner in which some of our white counterparts have. And so thinking that they accomplished these achievements in a previous generation where we know there were additional challenges for them just being African American and not having probably the support systems uh, that some of the African American players enjoy today, um, it makes what they did even more impressive to me. Absolutely, absolutely. And for the folks that may not be familiar with these two, so Lori McNeil played really in the same time timeline or time frame as Zena Garrison. So it was kind of the 80s and the 90s, if you will. And she retired in 2003, I believe it was. And Mal, who actually you and I were just talking about, Bryce, had a much shorter career, but pretty much he was in the 90s. So he turned pro in 89 and and pretty much got out the game right before 2000. So, you know, a shorter career, but that's sort of that timeline, folks, that we're uh, talking about as it relates to these two players. But again, we feel that they deserve a little bit of shine and we're hoping to be able to do that. Uh, in this particular episode. So, Bryce, how you want to kick it off? Well, actually, I know that we wanted to share something uh, before we jumped into some of their information as well, right? Right, yes. So, for those of you that, that are not aware, Zena Garrison and Chanda Rubin have a Facebook webcast called Game Set Chat. Every week, they bring on some previous coach or tennis player, and they talk about their career or the state of the game or or whatever and they're very good shows Um, I know that you can also see them they're out there on YouTube as well well today they released a town hall that they did uh, specifically around what's going on in the world right now with race and the Black Lives Matter movement and and the role that athletes and sports and politics and all these different entities play and it was an absolute excellent two hours of discussion and and there were on the in the town hall were of course of course Chanda Rubin, Zena Garrison, the broadcaster Andrew Krasny, tennis great Billie Jean King, the award winning journalist L Z Granderson, coach of Sloan Stevens, Kamal Murray, and of course, I'm sure everyone is familiar with James Blake, who, if you've not heard his story, he has a very relevant uh, (laughs) experience with New York PD uh, that happened back in 2015. Right, right. And folks, when I tell you that was a fantastic town hall Man, it cannot be understated. You all need to go out and listen to that recording. It was about an hour and maybe 45, 50 minutes. But Mm -hmm. let me tell you, it's worth every second. I appreciate 
the perspectives that each of the uh, each of the pre- people brought. Um, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate just and Billie Jean King is incredible, but uh, I mean <laughs> all of them were just incredible, and I really appreciated you know just the curiosity. I appreciated Andrew Krasny, you know, just by saying what can we do as a white male? What can I do to help? I mean, those are the types of things that that that's encouraging. That's those are the things that we want to we want to hear as we're trying to move forward and make some positive change and just some of the stories that Kamal and LZ and James spoke on I, I man it, it was a fan it was it was better than I anticipated I have me to too. say Bryce me I mean, too. It, yeah yeah it, it, it really blew me away it taught me some things you know as as an African-American male I just feel like some of the things that they pointed out were just so spot on so again, folks, I don't, we don't want to take this entire episode talking about that but do yourselves a favor and go out there and listen to that episode. It was great. That's, I agree completely. Yeah, yeah. So, did, did we want to say anything else, Bryce? I'm sorry I, I did, got out there and got all crazy with it, but. <laughs> no, 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 just, I mean, and we really shouldn't say a lot about it. People should just really go out and, and watch it and listen to it and and really internalize the message. And, and if we can all figure out, you know, what we can individually do better then that will of course improve the collective that's right because we all have a role and do not get it twisted folks we all have a role to play so it's right. not just one group looking at the other talking about you need to change uh-uh. we all have a piece of accountability in this if we are going to move this needle forward so don't forget that absolutely so Ooh. back to this episode which is what we're calling our unsung episode yes. um, and I want to give a shout out to my mom she originally uh, gave us this idea if you if you don't watch TV one they have a show called unsung and mm-hmm. what they do is they go back and they look at music artists of the past that yes. you know had a respectable career or they did very well but there was always a reason or there was something that stopped them from reaching their potential or maybe um, getting as far as they could. And so my mom was talking to me on the phone one day and she said, you know what, wouldn't it be interesting if you guys did an episode that was like that, but tennis players. So I brought that to one of our meetings we had and our producer CJ and Isaac were both like, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that we would do. So um, I think Isaac, the first two names that came off of his tongue were Lori McNeil and Malavia Washington. And I said, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's appropriate to me. So, uh, Absolutely. so Isaac, let's, let's kind of go down the stat sheet and let's start talking about some of the great accomplishments these two individuals had in their career. Absolutely. And so, of course, ladies first, we'll talk a little bit about Miss Lori McNeil. So, again, speaking of, you know, when she was playing the game, she turned pro back in 1983 and actually retired in 2002. And she got as high as number nine. (laughs) Let's let's say that again. (laughs) Number nine. You hear that tennis channel? You hear that tennis channel? (laughs) Not Not number number four. four. That was Zena Garrison. (laughs) Or, or that was James Blake. Right. <laughs> we don't know which one you got it confused with. But All right. Lori McNeil, number nine. Number nine, that's right. So she did make it into the top ten, which in itself is incredible, right, yeah. Bryce? I mean, right, right. It, yeah, yeah. And the fact that she was able to actually, with that, you know, get to number nine in the world, earn ten WTA titles. And Bryce, what I didn't even realize is, man, Lori, Lori did some did some things in the doubles range. Oh yeah, I, good lord, dude, it's well, it crazy. Well, I remember watching her. I and my mindset about Lori back in the day was actually she was more of a double specialist who would occasionally have some good singles results. Uh, obviously, when I look back at it, that's not really the case. But once again, it's all about marketing and promotion and all that. When you thought about uh, African-American women playing in that day, you thought about Xena and you didn't really think about anybody else. But right. how could you not for somebody that reached number nine in the world? <laughs> exactly. And I tell you, somebody that definitely thought about her was Steffi Graf. <laughs> Why, 
why does she think about it, Bryce? Why, 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 she, why, why does she think about it? <laughs> Look, Lori had two huge wins against Steffi Graf. Um, the first time she beat her, I believe it was in 1992, she beat her in the year-end championship in the first round. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that, and in straight sets too, I think it was like 7 6 six, four. Yep. That marked the first time since 1985 that Steffi Graf lost in the first round of any tournament. Wow. But as if that wasn't good enough, <laughs> oh, right? Lurie came back and saw her in, <laughs> <laughs> at, at Wimbledon in 1994. And guess yep. what? The first round. Mm -hmm. And she beat her 7-5, um, 7-6. Seven, seven, and yep. that marked the first time that a defending champion had lost in the first round. Yeah, and I remember, I think, it was it Chander or Xena that had talked about this? I can't remember who, but they remember they had said there was a buzz when they saw that first round matchup that had gotten, uh, that was announced. Then they, they were like, that that's some some interesting could potentially happen. And sure enough, Lori went out there and was like, am I scared of you, Steffi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I already done beat you. <laughs> and I want to highlight something. If, if everyone goes and listens to that uh, town hall, one mm -hmm. of the things that they mentioned is that many times African Americans, uh, especially in tennis, but in other sports as well, they are characterized as being good because they're good natural athletes. Right. And one of the things that I like about with Lori is, and, and I think Zena mentioned this, mm -hmm. most people when they play Steffi, number one, they lost, but number, <laughs> right. but but number two, they knew. Her forehand was her weapon. So they naturally went and tried to attack her backhand, which, you know, Steffi didn't come over her backhand much. She she had a really killer one-handed slice. But right. people thought, okay, let me stay away from the forehand and let me go for this slice backhand. Well, that was not Lori's strategy. Mm -hmm. Lori was like, no, no, attack her strength, yep. right? And get yep. into the net at every opportunity. And all I'm saying is, I don't know how many other people have beaten Steffi Graf in the first round of tournaments, and not just any tournaments, Wimbledon in the year-end championship in the first round. So I really wanted to bring that up to debunk this whole thought that African-American athletes are just about great athleticism. And it's not about having the smarts and the strategic um, balls, really, to go out there and to win matches. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you and honestly, Bryce, and I don't want to take this in any other direction, but you know I've always thought that in regards to the Roger Rafa head-to-head. Uh, -head. I always felt like Roger tried to attack Rafa's backhand too much. I felt like he should have been t attacking his forehand because, of course, it takes him so much, you know, to get that spin and that whip on it that if you come hard to that forehand, you could catch him. And mm -hmm. it, on hard courts, he would often make a lot of errors when you come hard at that forehand. But people were so afraid of it because it generates so much damn uh, spin. Um, right. But I always felt like that was something that I wish Roger had tried to do a little bit more is attack his forehand a bit more versus that backhand. But like I said, Lori was like, mm hmm. She's like, I ain't scared of your forehand. I'm going to come to it. And then I'm going to come and I'm going to come right into the net to your backhand. And we're going to see what it can do. And I think <laughs> make it do what it do, like you said, right? Absolutely. Yeah. L Lori was, it's interesting because I think in many ways, uh, because number one, they were great friends. They were from the same area. They played during the same period. I think Lori missed a lot of her shine because it was given to Zena. And don't get me wrong, Zena deserved every bit of shine that she got. But I think the focus went to Zena, and and maybe Lori was not acknowledged as much because most people don't know. Like you said, not only was she, did she make the top ten you know, number nine in her career, but she was number four in doubles. So right. she made the top 10 in both singles and doubles, and she played doubles with the best players out there in doubles. Ooh, Zena goodness. Garrison, Martina Navratilova, Gigi Fernandez, Helena Sokova, Katrina Adams, Renee Stubbs, and it just, <laughs> she, you know, she was really a complete tennis player. 
Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I mean, and honestly, when you look at her head to head as far as finals and doubles, I think what it was, she 33 and 31 as far as wins versus loss. I mean, that is insane, dude. Yep. 33 titles and 33 runner up. That's incredible. I mean, holy moly. Right. <laughs> and, and how often do we hear Lori's name mentioned when they are talking about, you know, some of the great women players of the past? Um, and and I, I love that we're doing this. I do want to mention a couple other things, little kind of fun facts yeah. about Lori that people may yeah. not know. Yeah, um, absolutely. Unlike Xena, Lori went to college rock. So, That's right. Yeah, so she played for two years at Oklahoma State University. Also, in 1987, she was named the WTA Most Improved Player. Uh, and that was the year that she made the quarterfinals of, of, of the Australian Open and the semifinals of the U.S. Open, where she defeated Chris Everett in the quarterfinals that year. Who, You know, she was a six-time champion herself. Mm-hmm. And then another very interesting thing is Lori was actually born, although, you know, we, we keep saying Houston, she's from Houston because that's where she was raised. Um, she was actually born in San Diego because um, her father was Charlie McNeil of the San Diego Chargers. Uh, defensive back, he played from 60 to 64, uh, and uh, he was an all-star player. Uh, for right. the San Diego Chargers. So um, she comes from some very good athletic pedigree. It's absolutely, absolutely. So sports was in the genes, sports was in the family. So it only, it only you know, seems right that she, she ended up being a professional in some sport. And like I said, bro, she did her thing in tennis. I mean, she is definitely someone that you want to, you know, you want to, give that shine to because she deserved it. And and she, you know, like I said, like with Xena, like, you know, it, they they paved the way for our our sisters, Chanda Rubin and mm-hmm. the Williams sisters yep. and your Sloans and your Madisons. You can't forget about these folks, uh, nope. uh, these people, folks. Um, they, they deserve their shine. And, and as you can see, based on what we said about Lori, she deserved the shine. She didn't get as much shine as she should have, but she definitely deserved shine. So we are hoping that we can give her some of that uh, just via this little episode. But man, it's her, her results are incredible, Bryce. Yeah. I mean, yeah, go ahead. And I'm going to say, and she does have some Grand Slam hardware because in That's 1988, right. she, yep. she won the mixed doubles title at the French Open with Jorge Lozana. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, you know, she she's got something up in her uh, her closet, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I mean, her and Zena were close. They got to the finals of Australia, but yep. then they ran into <laughs> never to love and Pam Shriver. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't gonna work out. Yeah, that wasn't gonna work out well for them. <laughs> no, <laughs> but they made it. They made the finals of a Grand Slam, so that in itself is a great accomplishment as well. So, lady, yeah, yeah, Lori, Lori, like I said, Lori did her thing, man. Just <laughs> oh, incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. All right. And so, you want to any, anything else we want to talk about with uh, with with Lori Bryce or? Uh, Nothing, nothing other than, and I may have to do a little research or we may have to just pick up the phone and call Xena. Um, mm, right. <laughs> uh, Lori keeps such a low profile that yeah, I yeah. I never hear anything about her. I mean, she, she may be more out and about in the whole Houston area. Right. But, you know, you never really see her around the game a whole lot. And I just kind of wonder how she's doing and what is she doing? Is she, you know, running camps or, in a, or an academy? Does she work at Xena's academy? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what no. she does. I think that is a great point, bro, is the fact that, yeah, she she does seem to be a bit out of the spotlight, which I don't know if that's by choice or not. But hey, Lori, if you happen to listen to this episode, because we are going to reach out to Xena and uh, we want to. Yeah, because we want to find out what's going on with you, because we should bring on the show platform. Exactly. We should bring Lori on the show. There you go. Because if you need a platform, hey, Brothers on Tennis got you. We got you. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, seriously, we got you. So we will reach out to Zena. We will find out what's going on. And like I said, if it's a matter of choice, then we will respect that and just know that we love you and we appreciate you for the things that you have done uh, for just all athletes in general, but specifically right. for those of color. Um, right. But again, if there's something you need, huh? you come on. We got you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So let's All move right. on to our brother over here, Mr. Malavia Washington. Yeah, brother Mal. Yeah. All these, all these siblings. Now you talk about being around. I mean, Mal has what, like four, five hundred siblings? <laughs> <laughs> I think he has three, two sisters and a brother. <laughs> but what's so cool is all of them have the M. So you got the Mashona, you got yes. the Shika, you got what was it, Michaela? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was Michaela. Yeah, and then you got Malave. Yeah, and so just yeah, but yeah, and they all and they all at some point played on the professional level. Isn't that wild, dude? Right. So that's how we were talking about the Maleva sisters, right? And you got the Washington family, if you will, since we got our brothers and sisters there. So that in itself is an incredible thing. Incredible. Yeah, and so their family came out of New York, and and just like you, we were saying, you know, Lori McNeil played for 19 years. Mal's career was only a 10-year career. And I, you know, I guess I did, in my mind, I didn't know that, but it kind of makes sense when I think about why he seems to be in a very limited capsule for me. When yeah. I think back on the history of tennis, because like you were saying, Isaac, I think before this, um, we recorded the show, he basically played in the 90s, 1989 right. to 1999. Right. And, um, and he had a very successful uh, career as well. We know that he uh, reached number 11 in the world. So he yeah. just, missed just missed being yeah. in the top 10. Just uh, missed. Yeah. And he, he did uh, capture four singles titles. Mm -hmm. uh, and his big, I guess his big moment in history with tennis is that he made it to the 1996 finals of Wimbledon where he... And now it's interesting because most people may remember that he lost in the finals in straight sets to Richard Krychek. Right, right. Or maybe people won't remember that because most people <laughs> they, don't even remember that Krychek won Wimbledon. <laughs> well, they, they might remember that streaker. That <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. But to me, when I think back on that Wimbledon, I remember the semifinals. Exactly. I remember that five-setter that he had with Tar Todd Martin. And... Yep. To me, that was actually his best win of his career. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. It was incredible to go five sets with another American and not being expected to, you know, to be able to pull it out to get to your first Grand Slam final. Man, yeah. That was a big, big uh, accomplishment for Mal, for sure. Right. And um, and like we, we mentioned with Gael Monfils, you know, Mal wasn't really about that doubles life. Uh, <laughs> no, he was not. Mom was like, I ain't got time to be. <laughs> so that is not my focus. <laughs> yeah. So his his doubles results are, are minimal, and yeah. uh, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time there. Uh, <laughs> unlike Lurry, though, unfortunately, neither in singles nor doubles was he ever able to get any Grand Slam hardware. But you know, especially as an African American male he was the one that carried that torch for that window of time so he right. was you know he was before james blake mm -hmm. and he was after ooh, do we have to go all the way back to arthur ash in terms of americans i, I know we had you know yannick noah yannick noah right but yeah. in terms of americans that really did anything uh it was probably arthur ash yeah, yeah, for, for sure, for sure, man. So, yeah, he was sort of, you know, a trailblazer in itself. And the fact that, like I said, there weren't very many around during his during that window that were playing tennis. I mean, there there just weren't. Um, so he was carrying the mount the mantle. And uh, that's that's a pretty that can be a pretty heavy burden to bear. <laughs> right, right. So some fun facts about Malavia. So he went to the University of Michigan. And I, I remember that standing out in my mind because I went to Ohio State and 
anybody that knows anything about rivalries and, and college sports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's Michigan. Yeah, Michigan was not my my friend, but no. um, in his sophomore year, he was the top ranked college player in the nation. Amazing. And and so uh, he played two years of, of college like Lori did. But also, he made the Olympic team in 1996 and made it to the quarterfinals. So I don't remember who he lost to in the quarterfinals. But if he had won that match, you know, he had an opportunity to put himself in position to play for a medal. Uh, That's right. So just missed out there. Yeah, absolutely. But hey, to be a part of the Olympics, to be able to make it and play for your country... That's that's pretty impressive. Back in '96, that's that's incredible. Right, right. So, yeah, man. so we just wanted to make sure that our listeners, you know, part of our job is to help educate. And uh, we, although we love players of all races, of all backgrounds, from all different countries, part of our platform is to specifically provide acknowledgement and shine and history of you know some of our players of color and if you are not familiar with Malavia Washington and you're not familiar with Lori McNeil we are in the age of YouTube and <laughs> yes we are and Google <laughs> and I would encourage you to go out there and to look up their careers and to watch some footage of of how they played especially Lori if you're yeah. a fan of the serve and volley and a, an aggressive game and coming into the net Lori had the most insane hands at the net. So uh, the best. So yeah. The best. And, and Malavia was a great uh, baseliner. It could come to the net. Just very solid ground strokes. Um, both very entertaining players to watch. Absolutely. No, I think that's such a great, uh, a great uh, point to make, Bryce. Is, yeah, folks, if you don't know and you haven't seen them play, just look them up. We are in that age, and, and, and trust me when I tell you, you'll find some really good stuff out there um, as it relates to uh, uh, them playing. So, um, yeah, check them out. Like I said, they are trailblazers. They deserve the shine. So let's make sure we give, uh, give them that support. Yes, definitely. So before we get out of here, Isaac, I, I'd like for us to, we have a few more minutes before we hit our 30 minute mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> just wanted to make sure everybody's staying on top of what's going on in the tennis news. Uh, the biggest news right now is as of right now, it looks like the U.S. Open is probably going to be a go. So um, it would start, I think, like, what is that, August the 29th, 30th, whatever. Right. They're, they're looking for it to be in Flushing Meadow. Um, obviously, there are going to be all kinds of special rules and protocols. Um, there won't be any fans, uh, but it will all be televised, and that is great news. Associated with the U.S. Open is that I think they've made a decision that the Cincinnati tournament, which is both uh, an ATP and WTA event, they're looking to move to New York for this year so that players can come to New York, play a warm-up tournament at the Open. We'll call it the Western Southern <laughs> you know, <laughs> tournament right. or whatever. But then they already will be there for the U.S. Open. And I personally think that's an awesome idea. Right, right. As do I, man. I think that it'd be good for them to get some reps, be able to play, and then really be in good form to, to, to show out at the quote-unquote, you know, U.S. Open, if you will. So I think right. it's a great design. And you better bet if the U.S. Open does happen, you you go ahead and you pencil in the French Open because there is no way the French Open, with all the stuff they done did, that <laughs> they're going to let the U.S. Open have their tournament and they're not going to have theirs. So, uh, so believe it or not, we may actually get three of the four Grand Slams in this year. And if you had asked me this a month ago, I would have been like, mm, nah, nah, I doubt it. Exactly. Don't think so. Right. Hey, times are changing. Right. So because these tournaments may be happening, keep your eyes on these exhibitions that are happening now because you're going to start to see bigger and bigger names play in these regional exhibition tournaments because they have to start getting some reps in. That's right. 
got to get up, got to find that form. You want to be right if you're going to go into a Grand Slam because you definitely will want to win it. I mean, especially given that it's, you know, a 2020 slam, mm -hmm. this by far would be one that you would want to win because your name would go in the, like an asterisk. It would always be called out. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, well, Isaac, do you have any final words for our listeners? No, nah, man. Folks, just stay safe out there. Love one another. You know, just be good. Just be good. Right, right. Um and in my in the infamous words of Mr. Don Cornelius, love, <laughs> peace, and so <laughs> <laughs> This is your boy Bryce. And this is your boy Isaac. And we are brothers on tennis. Stay safe. Talk to you next week.